Good evening to everyone, and we want to welcome you once more to our Wednesday night prayer and study hour here at Wellington SDA Live. Uh, we are in the words of William Carey. We are always expecting great things from God, and we plan to attempt great things for God. We want to welcome you to this space, to this place, and we hope and pray that as you've logged on tonight, mm -hmm. that truly your souls will be refreshed and that you will receive a tremendous blessing um, from our time being here this, after, this afternoon. Um, we ask and pray that you go ahead now and share this link, um, copy this link with someone whom you think will be benefited by this evening's, oops, sorry, with the, by this evening's, this evening's study. Again, we hope and pray you had a wonderful day and that surely goodness and mercy followed you as you went about your day's activities and you've come to this place to be encouraged in the things that pertaineth to the coming of, of Jesus. As you know, dear friends, it is customary for us to use the midweek, especially Wednesday, as a platform for encouragement, um, solidarity, where we come to share and to bear each other's burden and to encourage us as we go through the remainder of the week, as we anticipate the, the Lord's seventh day, seventh day Sabbath. Again, we just want to encourage you, if you have not, remember to subscribe to the church's channel um, um, and also go to YouTube and you know, my, type my name in and, and, and please subscribe to my channel. We do have a plethora of videos on that channel which we believe will be very, very instructive and beneficial for you in your spiritual journey, in your spiritual development. Also, friends, we want to say, remember the Three Angels Voice of Hope Prayer Ministry. We want to thank Sister Evans and her team for keeping this ministry going. Um, it is a place where prayers want to be heard. And um, if you have that, I want to encourage you, um, do log on. If you have a prayer request, remember to dial it in. 305-676-4113 and if you have the time to join in in the mornings 561-440-6854 Sundays uh, 5 a.m. To, to Saturdays then there's a midday 12 p.m. and then Mondays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. We want to encourage you guys to make full use of the prayer line. We believe in prayer and that prayer does change um, prayer brings a change in our situation and remember friends if you'd like to receive the study guides for this particular series um, to be added to our mailing list um, do reach out to us um, info at wellingtonsda.com or c.notatthefinalmovements.com we'll do our very best to add you to our mailing list and to get these study guides out to you in a timely and in a timely manner friends tonight again we have come with one objective and that is um, the essence of the prayer meeting we've come to stand in the gap to intercede for one another um, to call to harness the power of prayer and to seek to bear each other's burden and thus fulfill the law of Christ I like what Mr. Spurgeon said that we've come that we must seek to cast the burden of the present along with the sins of the past and the fear of the future upon the Lord. Why? Because we have, a, we have a good father. We have a kind and a compassionate father. A father who is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. A father who is long-suffering, who abounds in goodness and mercy, who opens his hands, as the Psalms says, and he satisfies the desires of every living thing. It is to that father that we appeal our case tonight. And as we go through life, friends, you know, we will have difficult moments. We will have challenges. Um, we are told that God had one son without sin, but he never had a son without trial and tribulation and test. And tonight, we're so thankful and grateful that we know that every difficulty, as Ellen White says, every difficulty in our lives, my dear friends, it is a call to pray every difficulty whether it is a financial difficulty whether it's a marital difficulty whether it's difficulty wearing children <laughs> where it's difficulty in health in business whatever difficulty you are 
encountering. It is a call to pray. And we believe that as we pray, we effect great change. Spurgeon says that we must pray that he may be prayed for. I like that. Pray that he may be prayed for. And if we desire others to pray for us, we must cultivate the habit of praying for others. The spirit of intercession. Pray for it. Pray that God gives you the spirit of intercession. Because that which we are careful to receive, said Mr. Spurgeon, we must be careful to be to bestow. Pray that he may be prayed for. And if we desire others to pray for us, we must cultivate the habit of praying for others. You know, the other day I was um, just doing some activities around the house and a fellow classmate face just popped in my mind. And you know, brothers and sisters, I tell you this, that Immediately, I just stopped what I was doing and I said, Lord, I don't know why he came in my mind. I haven't seen him for years, but I, I, I knelt and I sincerely lift him up in prayer. He's a pastor, um, his family. I don't know what the situation or the circumstances he may be going through. But at that time, I just felt an impression to pray for him. And we need more of that. We need more of the spirit of intercession to stand in the gap. As the song says, I need the prayers of those I love while traveling on life's rugged way that I may true and faithful be and live for Jesus every day. The song says, I want my friends to pray, to pray for me. And so tonight, friends, as we're about to transition into our prayer session, <clears throat> there are a few persons I do um, want you to remember in your prayer. One, remember uh, Scott George Smith. Scott um, is a good friend of mine, and as you know, you may see him on Facebook from time to time, and he is suffering from cancer. And he's going through, you know, he has a family, he has children, and he's doing the naturopathic way. Um, but we, are, we want you to remember him in your prayer. Also, we want you to remember our dear own sister, Sister Graham, Sister Graham, who sings, who has that angelic voice. Sister Graham, um, she is in the hospital. Um, she did a little bit of uh, surgery. We want to lift her up in prayer. Also remember Sister Jasmine, um, who has that benign cancer in the brain. We pray that the Lord will, will keep her and, and for deliverance. Um, she has a family, she has children. And we just want to commit these souls in the good Lord's hands. And, and not just them. There are many out there that you may know that are going through things. We want to lift them up in, in definitely in, in prayer. Um, remember to pray for our church, um, our pastors, um, the evangelists, the Bible workers, the medical missionaries, our schools, our institutions, our conference, our conference presidents, this world church of which we are a part of. Um, we're told to pray more and talk less. Uh, remember our leaders, Elder, Elder Ted Wilson. I'm sure he covets your prayers. And I'm sure he prays for his flock. He is the, the under-shepherd, under the great shepherd. I'm sure, if not by name, he lifts us up and we should be reciprocal um, as we pray for him. It's not an easy job. You know, I played sports all my life. You know, and you know when you play soccer, Division One. You always have these spectators who, you know, when they sit on the stand, they're telling you, man, you should have done this or you should have. And the game looks easier while you're on the stand. <laughs> but once you get in the game, you realize it's not as easy as you think it is. And if you think that leading the church, the world, this, this church in its <laughs> democratic system is easy, then you try being elected. Some of us can't even lead our own houses, let alone leading 20 million people. And so uh, remember him in your prayer. And remember our local churches. Remember Wellington, the Wellington Project, what we're seeking to do there in Wellington. Our youth. Our, um, our young people, um, they're leaving the Adventist church <laughs> by wholesale. Um, I don't know what's going on, brothers and sisters. And we, I have three, and, I, and I, pray, I pray dearly that they will not forsake the God 
of their fathers and, and the God of their mother, that they will remember the God of creation, the lessons that they learn in this home and that they will take with them as they go through life. And so we have a lot to give God thanks for. We have a lot to pray for. And listen, whatever the devil has taken away, he has not taken away our joy, he has not taken away our hope, and our, our, our looking forward to a better day. And so tonight, perchance, if you may have a special prayer request you'd like to put in the chat group, now is the time we're about to transition and to shift into our prayer, into our prayer session. As the song says, for you I am praying, for you I am praying, for you I am praying, I am praying for you. And so tonight, while we pray, and while we plead, and while we see our own sweet need, I invite as far as possible, to reverently join me in, in prayer. <clears throat> let, us, <clears throat> let us pray. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Tonight, Almighty God, we look to you as the flower looks to the sun. We approach your throne of grace and mercy in the name, that all-sufficient name, the name above all name, the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be dominion, power, now and forevermore. Tonight we claim the promise that if any man sin, that we do have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and that he is a propitiation for our sins, and not just for us, but for the entire world. Tonight we come because, Lord, we have no other help on earth and we have no other help in heaven but you. We come with sorrowfulness because we have, we have sinned. I have sinned. We have broken the commandments. If not in deed, we have broken them in thought and even in word. And we realize that the wages of sin is death but the grace of God bringeth repentance. And we're so thankful that the Holy Spirit, Lord, continue to prompt our hearts in us seeing our need for a closer walk with Jesus. And we recognize that prayer is not just an exercise in futility, that when we pray, something happens and we believe it, O oh God. And so tonight we come in the spirit of solidarity, in the spirit of intercession, Lifting up, O oh God, every individual tonight who is present on this line. Those who are watching by Facebook, those who are watching by YouTube. Lord, you know them by name. You know them by nature. You know their situation. You know the trials to which they are currently going through. And your grace is sufficient. Your grace is able. And we commit each soul under your watchful care. Do for them, O oh God that which they are unable to do for themselves, which is to give them the peace that passes all understanding, to grant them a complete and unbroken victory over sin, to keep their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and to say them in your everlasting kingdom. Lord, you have been so good to us. You have been exceedingly merciful unto us, and we are so thankful, Lord. And tonight all we can do is just renew our covenant, our commitment to you. We say, Lord, take our lives collectively and let it be wholly consecrated, Lord, to thee. We plead for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We plead, O oh God, for the early and the latter rain power to fall upon us and to fall on our children, dear Lord. Help us to be consistent with our Christianity. May we live that which we profess to be as Seventh-day Adventists. May our lights shine wherever we are so men may see our works and come to glorify our Father which is in heaven. Continue, O oh God, to send your angels to keep a strict watch over us as we go and as we come, as we lie and as we wake, dear Father. Be with our properties, our homes, our assets, our children, dear Lord, our plans for the future. We, we give them to you, O oh God. All that we have, we lay on the altar of consecration, dear Father. 
We lift up, Lord, especially the sick and the shut in among us. Remember, Sister Jasmine in a special way, Lord. And we will not, we will not cease to bombard the gates of heaven, O God, until deliverance comes to her house. Remember Scott, Lord. Remember Sister Graham also. And the others who are hurting, especially in our local congregation, dear Father. We lift up our elders, our deacons, our deaconess, and, and everyone, Lord, who frequents our church on a weekly basis and even on a weekly virtual basis. We pray for them and for their particular situation. We lift up, Lord, our world church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the apple of your eye, your remnant church, and every facet of the church, every branch of the work, our pastors, our teachers, our evangelists, our administrators, dear Lord, our professionals, Lord. Remember our teachers, our call porters, our self-supporting workers, the lay pastors, Lord. You know them. You know their churches. And we pray that as their days, so shall their strength be. Father, as we look around, it is, it is imperative. It is that time that is almost finished. And the signs lets us know that Jesus Christ is soon to come. And so we pray that we will have our lamps trimmed and burning, O oh God. We pray, dear Father, that we will not fall asleep on the enchanted ground, but may we be awake, O oh God, watching for your soon coming. Tonight, Lord, we're about to open the historical archives and to revisit our pioneers. And we pray that as we look tonight, Lord, and study, that this will speak to our hearts and that we can learn from their mistakes and emulate the good they did. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We thank you for answering our prayers. And we pray that when time on earth shall be no more and Jesus Christ would have returned a second time, it is my sincere prayer that all of us online and our loved ones and our children will be saved in your everlasting kingdom. The request that were mentioned tonight in the chat group, Lord, those who have family issues, those who have job issues, those who are seeking um, a better employment, Lord, those who are seeking to move to the country, Lord, we lift them up, dear Father. Um, those who are in the hospital, dear Lord, we, we pray for them in a special way, dear God, and that your name will be glorified in their lives. These mercies we ask in the, speci in the, in, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right. To God be the glory of great things he has done. If you have just logged on tonight, we want to say a good evening to you and we say welcome to our midweek prayer and study hour here at Wellington SDLI where we are always expecting great things from God and we plan to attempt great things for God. Tonight we're continuing our series Trailblazers and we are still blazing for the Lord. We are, uh, is the slide changing? Okay, we are continuing our series Trailblazers as we look at the lives of our pioneers. Our thematic text for this series is, as you know, Psalms 11, verse 3, where David asks an important question. If the foundation be destroyed, friends, what can the righteous do? It's almost a rhetorical question. There's not much we can do if the foundation is destroyed. And as ever before, the devil has been attacking the foundation of our church. And that is why we have been admonished that we should seek to revisit the lives of our pioneers. And as we look at them, our thematic quote is, may the fire, the fervor of their devotion, their dedication, may it light our, our way. You know, they did so much with so little, and we do so little with so much. And as we, and as we look at our pioneers, we, if we're honest, we can say that these men and women, they had an experience with Jesus. And it is this experience we need that will keep us during the time of trouble that is soon to break upon us, relentless in its fury. We are told that, 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 that we need an experience which, which the vast majority of us do not now possess. If you're honest, as I think you are, uh, we don't take great pleasure in the things of God. We can sit and surf the phone for hours in that right. We can twirl and twirl and twirl, and we don't even spend a fraction of that in prayer. 
in study, in reading the Bible. And friends, something radical must happen in our lives. And we're pleading that as we explore these lives, that something will happen, conversion will take place in our lives. Um, <clears throat> we've been looking at them from three perspectives, as again, historically, their order chronologically as they worked and experimentally um, as they labored. Now, we have we, we, we took a shift from the historical and we're looking at those pioneers who made shipwreck of their faith. Now, we have just two more to cover and then we're going to go back to a few more of our pioneers and then unfortunately we're going to have to bring this series to its close. 1 Corinthians 9.27, the Apostle Paul said, But I keep my body and bring it under subjection, underscore. Why? Lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The Apostle Paul was a man of great talent, a man that was gifted, a man that, was, that saw things and heard things. And he could say, this is the converted Paul, that he's asking the good Lord to keep him, because it is possible for a man to preach to others and himself be a castaway, be lost. What the Apostle Paul is warning the Corinthian church about is apostasy. And what is apostasy? What is apostasy? It is basically a total desertion from one's religion, from one's principle, from one's party, from one's cause. There is a mule that is at the General Conference. And on that wall, Alfred Lee, he he graphically describes the historical stages of the Adventist Church and there are persons and people etched on the wall. And as you look at the, the wall, the narrow pathway intently, you see some people falling off the wall. They have fell back in the world. And that is why the worldliness is so intense among us as a people. Now we've discussed, my brothers and sisters, everyone who who falls into the trap of apostasy would have trotted one of the five steps written in volume 5 of the testimony page 672 she says it is Satan's plan to weaken the faith of God's people in the testimonies Ali he works upon the minds to exercise jealousy and dissatisfaction against those at the head of the work he wants you to lose confidence in our leaders to become disenchanted with organization and to break off and do your own thing. He wants you to be independent. <laughs> no, God wants us to be dependent. Secondly, thirdly, the gifts are questioned and instructions given through visions are disregarded. Fourthly, then um, skepticism in regards to the vital points of our faith the pillars of our position and then we doubt the holy scriptures and then my brothers and sisters with the downward part to perdition which ends in destruction five steps to apostasy five steps to hell nathan tonight we're on lesson number 27 and we're going to lay a foundation we won't be able to, be able to cover his life in one setting the life of a man by the name of d m kenwright dudley Marvin can write. Now, there are some books I, I am going to put forth, which if, you, if you'd like to read more about the life of D.M. Kenrod, as he's affectionately called, you, these are two books I highly, I highly encourage, I highly rec I recommend. Uh, one by Carrie uh, Johnson, I was Kenwright's secretary, and the other one that, that is put up by Vance Farrell, the man who boarded the Phantom. The Phantom is almost a, a mirage, a ghostly ship. Um, D.M. Canwright. Um, excellent reading. Um, trust me, it, 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 it pulls you in. Right? And so I just want to, you know, if you'd like to read more on, on D.M. Canwright, that you would actually go and get those books. Now, before we look in the life of Canwright, now we won't be able to cover Canwright in one session, but I want to lay a foundation and I want to read some quotations which are, which I think is, they are germane as an as, as a introduction to the life of Dudley Kenwright. We are told, friends, in volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 1881, she says, in the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. Why? Because they are self-sufficient, they are independent, and God cannot use them. Friends, as we near the end of time, 
we're going to see that God is going to work through humble instrument, men and women who are distrustful of self and accolades and education and who, who are humble, who are teachable, men who and women who have not been tainted by the teacher of erudition, Lucifer. Few great men will be engaged. As a matter of fact, one more um, quotation, we're told the time is not far distant when the test will come upon every soul. Many a star that we have admired for their brilliance will go out in darkness. We're told chaff like a cloud will be borne away on a wind even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. Brothers and sisters, many a star, many a preachers that we have we have idolized and glamorized many of preachers who we have sought after. These are the ones that are revered um, on Facebook, on YouTube. These are the ones that we, we almost deify. Many a star. They will, well, we have admired for their brilliance, their brilliant way of thinking, their brilliant preaching, their brilliant concepts. We are told will then go out in darkness. You know, friends, when I think of, as I read these statements, when the Lord called me to ministry, um, I was attending FIU, which is a, a popular university, about two hours south of, of where I live. Um, it's a wonderful school. It's a university, an international university with kids from all over the world. And I was a starting forward for the men's division, NCAA, Division I, football or soccer team and when the Lord called me to preach you know you know he kind of showed me the model of preaching that I should kind of pattern and friends I tell you this um, my class at Oak was a very huge class and we had a lot of tremendous young people who came through and all had an intrinsic calling to ministry and I never really wanted to be a pastor I've always felt that God was leading me more into evangelism to do evangelistic work and you know we would I would study the greats and men like C.D. Brooks and we'd listen to Stephen Lewis tapes and B.E. Cleveland and J. Malcolm Phipps and and Bill Scales and we would I would watch these men and and you know and kind of you know internalize their concepts until it became my concepts and you know use their gestures and so forth and there, there are nights where, where I would lay in my dorm room in Edwards and I envisioned myself in being some great evangelist, speaking to thousands, you know, just in my mind, I see myself traveling. And, and, and listen, and I've, I've traveled some places, you know, uh, to God be the glory. But friends, you know, as I mature in the faith, I don't pray those prayers anymore. As a matter of fact, I have no desire for any kind of greatness. Uh, I, 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 I am not um, coveting notoriety. Um, I, I, I sincerely believe that, that God, as Ellen White says, we should not strive to be great. We should strive to be faithful. As a matter of fact, there was a text that, that in my aspiration to be great, that kind of deflated my ego. It was Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 5. And it's a powerful text where Jeremiah says, he says, seekest thou great things for thyself? He says, seek them not. And you see, friends, we are not striving to be great. We should strive to be a faithful preacher. Are you with me? A faithful evangelist. Now, the reason why we should not strive to be great. Now, understand me that grace is able to keep us. Are you with me? But the reason why I personally do not strive to be great is because of this. We are told in Ministry of Healing, page 21. Again, this is just a, a preface for Dudley Kenwright. We are told in Ministry of Healing, she says, um, she says, the cup most difficult to carry is not the cup that is E-M-P-T. Well, what's that, Nathan? Empty. That's not a hard cup to carry, the empty cup. Look what she says now but the cup that is full to the brim. It is this that needs the most careful balance. Affliction and adversity brings disappointment, right? And sorrow, 
but it is what it is prosperity that is most dangerous to the spiritual life friends I'm telling you I have no desire to be great listen brothers and sisters, if I've come to a point now that I, I listen if, if I rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God saints I'm, I'm serious it is prosperity that is dangerous to the spiritual life and I'm gonna say this brothers and sisters it is true that gifted people and pretty people are usually in jeopardy let me say it again gifted people and pretty people are usually in jeopardy if you are gifted if you have a talent friends you need to ask God to keep you humble ask him to keep you humble lest you become humiliated now as we look at the life of Dudley M. Kenwright, friends, let me say this. If paper could speak, what I have read about Dudley Kenwright, he is by far the most profound, prolific preacher the Adventist church has ever had. And we look at this thing, we look at the, the C.D. Brooks who, who and, and the Henry Wright, these men who are what we call master orator. But when it comes to Dudley Kenwright, based on what was on paper, in an era when there was no television, this man was in a league of his own. Everybody wanted to hear Dudley Kenwright preach and teach. It was said that Dudley Kenwright, he, 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 had a, he was a master orator. And his sermons, his sermons was, was uh, well, one, one, one critic said, one historian said, his sermons would have the effect of a hand grenade tossed in the midst of a crowd. They would burst like a bubble in the soul and they would do damage to the dominion of sin. Dudley Kenwright, he was gifted. He was bad. Bad means good. Everybody wanted to hear Dudley Kenwright preach and teach and he had a way with words. Master orator. But at the same time, this man, Dudley M. Kenwright, he was a man of dual personality. He was almost oftentimes like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And, we're gonna, and I'm going to expound upon this. Now, I want to, to digress and just lay a foundation briefly at the, 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 the early stages of Dudley M. Kenwright and how he came to join the Adventist Church. Please read now Dudley Kenwright in late 1831. In late 1831, Hiram and Loretta Kenwright moved to an 80-acre farm near Kinderhook in southern Michigan. Soon after their first-born son, Dudley K Marvin was born on September 22nd, 1840. So look at the time from when Kenwright came on the scene. We're four years shy of 1844. Obviously, he's an infant, so he has no clue about Millerism and Millerite movement. So when Ken Wright comes to, uh, to, to maturity, the Adventist church is in its infancy. We have left the first angel. We have proclaimed the second angel. We are now midway in the third angel's message. Are you with me? Dudley Ken Wright. The record now... The early parts of his life is, is, not, is not known, and so there are, there are huge gaps. But when we pick up Dudley Kenwright, Kenwright is 19 years old. Please read now, 19 years later. 19 years later, in 1859, Dudley went to live with an uncle near Albion, New York, so that he could attend school. And that spring, he began working for a Seventh-day Adventist farmer and minister, Roswell F. Cottrell. Now we covered Roswell F. Cottrell earlier in our in our Pioneer series, right? Please read now. While working in the cornfield together, young Dudley learned about the Sabbath truth and the third angel's message. So here we see, by the time in 1859, we're, we're, we're well under the third angel's message, the Sabbath truth. And, and let me just say this, you know, I received a phone call uh, yesterday and it was from a former or elder of mine and he asked me a question he says not I want to ask you a question and please answer me straightforward I have my wife uh, on the phone what is the seal of God now this is a, a, a this is a seasoned elder um, and I said I thought it was a trick question I was like you know the seal of God is the same day Sabbath he said that's what I thought and he said to me are you familiar with the teaching that is being taught within the church now that the seal of God is the Holy Spirit? I said, yes. 
It is, com it is coming out of Andrews. And it has been advocated and advanced by young ministers. Friends, let me just deviate. The seal of God is not the Holy Spirit. The seal of God is God's seventh day Sabbath. The text they use, is, I think it's Ephesians 4.13 where it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit where you are sealed. The Holy Spirit is a, the third member of the Godhead. He is the sealer, but he's not the seal. The Sabbath is an entity. The Holy Ghost is a, is, is a person. Don't confuse them. The Holy Spirit is not the seal. The seal of God is the seventh day Sabbath, which is, which is found in the fourth commandment. So look, don't let them trick you, or let, don't let them fool you. That is heresy. And I'm telling you, if you know people who are, who are advancing, you need to rebuke them publicly. Now do it in love. But don't back down, friends. And it is sad that we have come to the end of time and, we are, and, and people are still trying to debate whether or not the Sabbath of God is the seal of God. So here we see now that, that he got the Sabbath truth and he got the third angel's message. Now look what happened now. Please read now that summer. That summer, following a tent effort held by James White, not far from Albion, he accepted the Advent message and was baptized soon after by Elder Cottrell. Now look what happened now. After he was baptized, you know, we are told that that as one become a, a, a member of our church, he, is, he becomes a missionary. And look what his first missionary, his first converts was. Please read now. Ken Wright's first convert was his mother. Wow. For thrilled with the message, he hurried home to share it with his family. Uh -huh. She remained true to the Advent message to her death. There it is, brothers and sisters. You know, we are told that distance lends no enchantment to Christian service. If you want to be a good missionary overseas, begin at home. His first convert was his mother, and she remained a lifelong Seventh-day Adventist. She died in faith of the third angel's message. Now, it was evident at this point that God was calling Dudley Kenwright for, for, a, for, a, for a great work. Now, look what happened now. Please read now, remaining. Remaining on the farm for a time, he helped with the work. And then when about 21, he traveled the nearly 40 miles north to Battle Creek to talk with Elder James White about entering the ministry. Now you must understand now, we're well in the 60s now, right? The church is in full swing. James White is one of the leading figures in the Adventist church. Um, and people are being impressed to come into the fold. So he desires to go and speak with um, Ella James White about becoming, joining the work. Look what happened. Please read now, Ella White. Elder White gave him a Bible mm. and a set of prophecy charts, mm -hmm. and he went out and began preaching. Mm -hmm. Later, Elder White raised money for a library for the young evangelist. Brothers and sisters, that was our institution. We had no schools. We had no doctorate program. We had no master's program. We had no BA. We had no associates. And it seems to me that these things uh, have become a hindrance to the work than an assistance. In ancient time, when you were called in the Adventist early, they gave you a Bible, they gave you a chart, and they say, go and preach. And these men preach with power and with Holy Ghost. They did more to stabilize the members in the church. And what we are seeing now, we have a plethora of people who have degrees and they are confused in more than anything else. And I've, and I've said it before that while education is good and God wants us to be educated, and I'm an educated person, but it seems to me that education has become one of the greatest curse of the Adventist church. Till many have become educated worldlings. And I'm telling you this, it seems to me the more degrees our ministers get is the more mute they come, the more confusing they become. They go off on some weird theological concepts. But there it is. What did Dudley Kenwright get? He got a Bible, he got a prophetic chart, the 1843 chart, the Law of God chart, and he went out and he preached. Now you must understand that James White and Ellen White, they took Kenwright as a son. They saw the potential in him. This was a time where evangelists was in great demand. 
and they saw him as a prodigy. Yeah? A young upcoming evangelist who had the gifts. And so they sought to nurture the gifts. And let me just say this, you know, you know, friends, you know, one of the things I, that, 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 that I really, it really hurts my heart to see within the church is that the gift of evangelism is not nurtured. Where are the evangelists? Where are they? Friends, in comparison to the amount of pastors we have within the church, where are the evangelists? You, you, you name them. You can probably name, probably name a few. In the Caucasian community, you name them. We may have one or two. In the Hispanic work, where are they? In the African-American work, where are they? Where are the evangelists? It's almost as if that, that this gift is, is despised, it is mocked, it is tabooed, brothers and sisters. But in the early part, it was nurtured. Five gifts he gave the church. And the church cannot be perfected unless all five gifts are in operation. Are you with me? Now look what happened now, right? So... James White raised money and bought books for young Dudley Kemwright. And let me just say this, in a large sense, he was autodidactic, self-taught, literally self-taught. Um, he taught himself, he had a huge vocabulary, homiletics, he taught himself, and the spirit was with him. And look what happened now. As he is receiving the message now, Look what he says. Please read now. Present truth looks clearer and more beautiful to us the more we study it. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for a religion that agrees with the Bible, uh -huh. common sense, yes. and the wants of man. Wow. He wrote to the Review and Herald as he held evangelistic series up and down the state of Michigan. Did you get that? When he looked at the Adventist church, he, 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 he drew two conclusions. Three. One, a Bible, a religion that agrees with the Bible. Number two, it has common sense. Number three, it agrees with the wants of men. In other words, we are not so heavenly minded to be no earthly good. Are you with me? Now look what happened now. Please read on, on May 29th. On May 29th, 1865, D.M. Canwright was ordained by James White and J.N. Loughborough in a service held at Battle Creek. He was 24 years of age. He was 24 years of age, and he was on fire for Jesus, right? But as D.M. Kenwright began to work, there were traits and tenets that showed his volatility and his own weakness. We're told in the middle of 1866, look how far we are now, 66, right? Ken Wright began evangelistic work in New England, but found the territory so conservative that frequently he had but little fruit. It was during this period that certain weakness in Ken Wright's character began to reveal themselves. And you know what God does? Oftentimes God allows difficulties for our character faults, traits to be revealed, our defects, so we can do what? So we can give them up. We can gain victory over them. And friends, I've come to discover that what we do not overcome will in turn overcome us. Now look what happened. Please read now following. Following an apparent failure in the work or a supposed slight by another, a deep discouragement would come over him that could go on for weeks and even months. Doubts about the existence of God would sweep over his mind. At times, he came close to outright atheism. Wow. So what's happened? So what was Ken Wright's problem, Sister Nath? What's his problem? He would doubt. He would doubt. He would be given the discouragement. You know, when he looked for success and it didn't come, it would definitely damper his spirit. And you're going to find out that he suffered from this until the day he left the church. As a matter of fact, it was one of the things that drew him out of the church. We're told, friends, that doubt and discouragement are Satan's number one's weapon. When I think about Dudley Kenwright's um, periods of discouragement and doubt, it brings my mind back to Doubting Castle and Giant Despair. You are familiar with it. 
where Christian and Hopeful found themselves in a castle. And Giant Despair was out walking one morning and he finds them sleeping on his ground. He takes them and he shuts them up in his dark dun dungeon. And he beats them and he beats them. And, and it was his intent for them to commit suicide. Dudley Kenwright found himself shut up in Doubting Castle and Giant Despair was his tormentor. Friends, as we go through life, as we journey through Christianity, we at times will find ourselves going through Doubting Castle. There are times where we become discouraged. Isn't that right? We become doubtful. Yeah? We wonder if God is with us. Mm -hmm. We wonder if... You know, th th listen, there was a time in my life where I thought maybe I need to reconsider what I'm preaching. Because, Lord, I'm not getting no traction. I'm not getting no employment. Well, I still haven't gotten any employment anyway. <laughs> I'm saying, Lord, okay, maybe... Maybe we are the weird one, okay? Maybe I need to lay off this Ellen White stuff and this historic Adventist stuff because it, no doors are being opened, okay? It's just breathing more alienation. And friends, I literally thought that maybe I was taught wrong. Because when we looked around at, at a general, only a handful of us was trying to make inroads. And guess what? It was bringing us nowhere. We were labeled fanatics and offshoots and Ellen White grandson. And, and, and if they brought us in one time, they wouldn't bring us again and doors were being shut. So there was a time where I found myself literally going through doubting castle, questioning. Now what, remember in, in, in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, this is an allegory. So what exactly is doubting castle, right? Look what happened now, right? Please read Doubting Castle. It symbolizes? Symbolizes spiritual periods of doubt, uh -huh. distress, uh -huh. and discouragement in which the Christian is apt to fall into a result of ill-advised moves, uh -huh. non-success, or being overcome by some particular sin or leaving the revealed will of God. So there it is. It can symbolize a multiplicity of things. But for me, I was saying to myself, you know, a little of us, we left Oakwood, we didn't get hired. We didn't want to go to Andrews. Nobody hired us. We had to go off in self-supporting ministries. Had to learn to burn DVDs, man, record yourself, you know, and, and, and try to make it work. And, and you look around and people who are not saying what I'm saying, man, they, the doors are open for them. They're ordained. They've they have jumped one or two, three, four conferences. They've moved up to youth director. And I'm saying, okay, Lord, maybe something's wrong with me because there ain't nobody calling me. I mean, the movers and shakers ain't calling me. The people who are calling me, they can't really help me. Friends, I was there. And you may be, you may be, be there right now. Dudley M. Kenwright was there. When I think of this doubt in Castle, brothers and sisters, I think of John the Baptist. You know, great success had attended his ministry. We are told people came from every walks of life to hear John the Baptist preach. But what happened to John the Baptist? John the Baptist was arrested. He was placed in Herod's prison. And we see now this active evangelist. He found himself shut up in Doubting Castle. I thank God for Steps to Christ. There's a chapter in that book entitled, What to Do with Doubt. It's a wonderful chapter. And if you know someone right now, or you yourself, who may be shut up in Doubting Castle, you need to go and read that chapter, What to Do with Doubt. Jesus, the disciples had come to Jesus and said, Jesus, listen, John the Baptist is in prison. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible says now, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed then to teach them to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard, so, sorry, now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Art thou he that should come, or should we look for another? What? It was John the Baptist who had announced in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God. It was John the Baptist who had baptized Jesus, and he heard the heavens open, Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But now John the Baptist is shut up in Doubting Castle, and he is now questioning 
the very one of whom existence he announced, brothers and sisters. And there are many people who are questioning whether or not the Adventist church is God's true church. Am I in the right church? Am I in the right message? Because after all, man, the, the things I believe, I'm getting no traction. Look what Jesus said now in, in verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who shall not be offended of me. John, the disciples went back to prison. And they sought to encourage John in his moment of despair. It's amazing that Jesus himself never went to the prison. I could imagine what was going through John's mind. Here's my cousin. I'm in prison. You heal everybody else. Why you don't come and encourage me? You know, the, the, the prison where John was located, based on Josephus, um, Josephus, in his writings, uh, we find mention made of the imprisonment of John by Herod, the Tetrarch at the castle of Maracus. He was in, actually in a castle where he was subsequently put to death. It was a fortified hilltop palace located on the Jordan, 25 kilometers in the south of the Mount of the Jordan River on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. So it was in proximity where Jesus could have easily well visited John. John himself found himself locked up in Doubting Castle. Ken Wright began to doubt at times, doubt the existence of God. It even drove him to atheism. In this half age, Ellen White captures John's final moments, and she said, please read her you know, The Life of John. The life of John had been one of active labor, and the gloom and inaction of his prison life weighed heavily upon him. As week after week passed, bringing no change, despondency and doubt crept over him. His disciples did not forsake him. Wow, look what happened now. She says now they were? They were allowed access to the prison, and they brought him tidings of the works of Jesus, and told him how the people were flocking to him. But they questioned why, if this new teacher was the Messiah, he did nothing to effect John's release. Mm. How could he permit his faithful herald to be deprived of liberty and perhaps of life? You know, when I think about this, I, I go back to John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and I was listening to it. When I go to my bed, sometimes I listen to Pilgrim's Progress, you know, the battle with Apollyon. And when Christian meets Apollyon, and, 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 and when, 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 when Apollyon, he seeks to reason with Christian, hey, I'll raise your pay. And when he realized that Christian's not interested in his pay, he brings in an argument by saying, listen, the one whom we are following, look how his subjects end up. They're beheaded. He never comes to their rescue. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I have delivered mine by lying and cheating and flattery. But here we see Jesus made no effort to come and visit John. John was discouraged and in great despair. We're told, look what happened, these questions. These questions were not without effect. Mm -hmm. Doubts which otherwise would never have arisen were suggested to John. Wow. Satan rejoiced to hear the words of these disciples mm. and to see how they bruised the soul of the Lord's messenger. Mm -hmm. Oh, how often those who think themselves the friends of a good man Mercy. and who are eager to show their fidelity to him prove to be his most dangerous enemies. Mm. How often, instead of strengthening his faith, their words depress and dishearten. I think of Job's three comforter, where Job says, miserable comforter for R.E. Job was discouraged. And when they came to encourage Job, they discouraged Job even more. In other words, Job was in a more discouraged situation, posture, than when his three friends came to encourage him. So here we see now, we're told now, to the discouraged, please read now. So the discouraged prophet, all this seemed a mystery beyond his fathoming. Mm. There were hours when the whisperings of demons tortured his spirit. Been there. And the shadow of a terrible fear crept over him. Been there. Could it be that the long hoped for deliverer had not yet appeared? Mm. Then what meant the message that he himself 
had been impelled to bear. Could it be that the thing you're preaching not is the wrong message? Maybe those tapes you've been listening to where those guys were off key? Friends, I've been there. And you know, the thing that helped Ken Wright was the thing that helped to get Christian and hopeful out of Doubting Castle. It was the promises of God. In 1 Peter 1, 4, 2 Peter 1, 4, Peter says, Whereby he has given unto us very great and precious promises. I find out, friends, that when I'm discouraged, when I'm a little bit downcast, I tend to seek solace, not by lighting up a big ganja spliff or taking a drink. No, I find solace in the word. I tend to find a promise that fits my particular situation. And through that, I am able to keep my sanity, even to keep my psyche, yeah? And so friends, I want to encourage you tonight. Maybe there's someone who's watching and you find yourselves at times a little bit downcast, a little bit discouraged. You feel that you're all alone. Know this, you're not alone. And God is with you. I encourage you, find a promise. Once you find the promise, pray over the promise. Yes? After you pray over the promise, preach the promise to yourself. Right? And then now, trust that promise. And fourthly, ask God to make this promise real to you. That's the remedy. That's the antidote for doubt and discouragement. And you're going to find out that that was what helped to keep Dudley Kenwright in his ups and downs as he sought to win souls for Jesus and to battle with his own personal problems as he was having. As a matter of fact, there you must understand that all the promises of God are true. We are told in Christ's objects as we wind down. She says, please read now, God stands back. God stands back of every promise he has made. With your Bible in your hand, say, I have done as thou hast said. I present thy promise. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Friends, God stands back of every promise. You know, when we used to travel and we used to sell DVDs and people used to write, write checks, I would jokingly say, it ain't robbery, right? <laughs> meaning that what? This thing will bounce. Meaning that there's no funds to back the check. But God's promises don't bounce. God has enough resources. He stands back of every promise he has made. We are told in Numbers 23 verse 19 that God is not a man that he should lie. Why should he lie? Are you with me, friends? We are told again, Satan is exalted. Please read now. Satan is exalted. Satan is exultant when he can lead the children of God into unbelief and despondency. There it is. He delights to see us mistrust in God, mm. doubt in his willingness and power to save us. Mm -hmm. He loves to have us feel that the Lord will do us harm by his providences. Mm. It is the work of Satan to present the Lord as lacking in compassion and pity. There it is. He delights in discouragement. He wants you to, become, to, to begin to doubt the scriptures. Doubt whether or not this is a true church. Doubt your salvation. He glories in doubt. She goes on to say, perhaps. Perhaps he loves others, but he does not love me. Mm. All this is harm in your own soul. Mm. For every word of doubt you utter is inviting Satan's temptations. Mm. It is strengthening in you the tendency to doubt and it is grieving from you the ministering angels wow when satan tempts you breathe not a word of doubt or darkness do not breathe he wants you to believe that you believe that god loves others more than he loves you in the book education friends we're told we need not look we need not look for outward signs outward evidence of the blessings the gift is in the promise. And we may go about our work assured that what God has promised he is able to perform and that the gift which we already possess will be realized when we need it most. Cheer up. 
my brother and sister, live in the sunshine. You'll understand it by and by. During World War II, there were various ways by which allies sought to communicate. Uh, spies sought to um, transport um, messages. And there were some very ingenious methods of taking secrets to one camp and the other. One was invented by this German man, which was a specific ink that was written, but it could only be seen when it was held under the light. And so they would write these messages, um, you know, of strategic plans of the enemy. It was brought back to the base and it was put under a specific light. And voila, the information was there. If you saw it, you saw regular paper. And as time progressed, there were other um, um, modes that were invented whereby, you know, uh, notes were transcribed, but a certain portion uh, had to be um, wiped over it for the what? For the messages to come forth. You know, when I think of this, I think of what Charles Spurgeon said, so profound as we close. He said this. He said, many a promise is written in sympathetic ink which you cannot read till the fire of trouble brings out the letters. Hallelujah. Let me read it again, since I said you, you ought to be shouting tonight. So Mr. Spurgeon says, many a promise is written in sympathetic ink, which you cannot read till the fire of trouble brings out the letters. And that is why, brothers and sisters, the Bible says we, he has given us Precious promises. By these, the Bible says, we are able to become partakers of his divine, divine nature. You know, as we look at Ken Wright's life, there were times where he felt he wanted to leave ministry. And were, listen, he did quit. He quit ministry. And through Ellen White and James White's counsel, he was able to come back but it was something he battled with until finally the devil just drove him over the cliff. There may be someone tonight watching who you find yourself from time to time doubting whether or not God loves you. I find myself at times wondering if God, you know, has remembered me. <laughs> I'm saying like Joseph, man, but has been in the dungeon for two more. Has God forgotten me? You see others advancing in the work in ministry and you're still trying to get a door open and and these are thoughts sometimes I have to shake these thoughts off because God has not forgotten me God loves me with an everlasting love and friends I want to tell you tonight that God loves you may God help us to shake off discouragement Martin Luther once said to Melanchthon he was discouraged of what the papacy was doing to him he said let's sing a hymn and startle the devil May God bless you as we seek to find comfort and encouragement in the Word of God. You find those promises that are apt to your special, specific situation. And may God help you to uh, internalize those promises until they get you out of Dalton Castle and free from giant despair. Loving Father in heaven, O oh God, we thank you. We thank you that all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen and Lord we know that as we journey uh, through this thing called Christianity there are days oh God when the cloud seems to hover over us and there is no sunshine we oftentimes feel discouraged despondency there is great despair hovers over our soul and we at times feel like we should give up we should quit Nobody cares. Nobody is concerned. But help us to remember that we have a friend in Jesus. And he has given us his word. And the promises are there to comfort us and to keep us. Bless all the online viewers and may you be with them in their journey. Grant us all a good night's rest, we pray. And tomorrow, 
give us the strength to take on the week's challenges and bring us here back at the appointed time and to your house of worship. And at last, when time shall be no more, save us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, saints, uh, it was good, and we, we thank everyone who logged on tonight. We hope that you were blessed by this um, study. We've just laid a foundation. There's so much in Dudley Ken Wright's life, and every, every stop is a learning curve for us. And so we will continue. We may get about three or four, about four-ish lessons out of Ken Wright's life, and then we're going to move, up, move back to the regular pioneers, we only have a few more sessions left in this series. We're going to bring it to a close, and we have some new series we want to bring forth. Again, we want to give a shout out to everyone um, that is that, that that is watching. Um, I saw some posts that were made. Um, Sister Evelyn said, "Yes, the Sabbath commandment clearly has the three elements: the seal of God, exactly." And friends, I want to again, I want to sound the alarm: beware of this false teaching that is making inroads among us as a people, that is saying that the seal of God is the Holy Ghost, that is doctrines of devils. The seal of God is the, whole, is the fourth commandment. The Holy Spirit is the sealer, but he's not the seal. You have the seal, you have the sealer, and you have the sealing, right? So we want to, we want to keep them in their order, okay? Friends, God bless you. We're praying for you. We look forward to seeing you this Sabbath. We have our Holy Communion. May God help us to prepare ourselves as we approach the Lord's table. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. As of always, we say, saints, in the words of the ancient, behold, saints, the I followed. <laughs>